Almighty God, touch the my lips of clay that we may all draw inspiration, not just from my words, but from your holy scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, well, normally I'm very well prepared when it comes to sermons. Uh, whether or not I use it is neither here nor there. I am well prepared. I have written my sermon. Today that wasn't the case. It hasn't been the case all the way through Holy Week. The sermons have kind of come upon me, as it were, um, when I've heard the scripture being read. It was the same on Monday, Thursday, it was the same uh, on Good Friday, and it was the same last night especially. Well, tonight I had a sort of, today I should say, I had a sort of idea what the sermon was going to be, but it was only really when I heard the gospel uh, that it hit me very strongly what it was going to be. Well, for a start, we have to accept, I suppose, if we're here in a metropolitan community church, then we have to accept somewhere along the line that we were all born from God, we were all begotten by God, we were all created by God as a conscious act of creation. Amen. Now that act of creation carries in itself the certainty of love. <coughs> that act of creation carries in itself the certainty of love. And yet our lives are frequently, in fact, mostly dominated by the Mary experience, the Mary Magdalene experience. The experience in the garden where she is weeping and she's weeping because her Lord has been taken away and she doesn't know where her Lord has been taken. And she's having this communication with a man that she believes is the gardener. Our lives are like this. We wail and we sorrow and we despair because our Lord has been taken away, our joy has been taken away. The love of God in which we nestled as infants has been taken away. And we were asked not just once, but ever again, by the men and women that we see, what we are looking for. And only rarely do we realize that the men and women that are asking for this are our Savior, in this case, the risen Savior, Christ. Because we are called to see Christ in our brothers and sisters, and we see that frequently as a metaphor. Oh yeah, I know, we've got to do that. Yeah. We've got to see Christ in our brothers and sisters. Well, um, we've really got to see Christ in our brothers and sisters. We have to see Christ in those who would seek to ask to bring us refreshment when we are in sorrow and when we are in pain, because no human being can do that without the God that begat us, without the Holy Spirit that hovered upon us, the Holy Spirit which hovers upon the waters of creation and brings light and life and peace, the same Holy Spirit that hovers upon this place now and hovers on each and every one of us. I think it is because we lead lives in which we see the ordinary, the mundane, as coming about everything else, that we cannot see when the extraordinary, the super mundane, the grand, and the tremendous is upon us. We find it hard to believe that Clinton, that guy you've known all your life, has the Holy Spirit offering above him, and has the arms of the ever-living God embracing them, and the promise of eternal life surrounding them. We get caught up with the fact that that Clinton's also the same person that goes home and plays with the dogs and, and hoovers the carpet and cleans the carpet on occasion and does the washing up and has a shower and a shave. These things overwhelm us. These petty things overwhelm us. Going to the supermarket, buying stuff, finding money, obsessing about money, worrying about where we're going to be in a year's time financially. All these things we obsess about. I can preach until I'm blue in the face, and we will still obsess about it. But we need to come to some sort of realization, realization that the old truism about the definition of madness also applies to the way we try and live our spiritual lives. That if we do the same thing 
over and over again and expect a different result, then it's madness. If we want a different result, we have to do something different. We have to believe something different. Yes. Yes. If we want a different world, then we have to do earth-shattering things. And people do do them, so there's no excuse for any of us. Single lives can change everything. We most commonly think of single lives that have changed everything for the worst. Yes. You know, you think of the Hitlers and the Mussolinis. But my goodness, there was still a single life that changed the course of human history. Think also of the Gandhis and the Nelson Mandelas. Mm -hmm. yes. Think of those single lives. What was different about them? Well, actually, nothing. I believe nothing. Because if we believe that they were extraordinary set-aside saints, then we let ourselves completely off the hook. Because it means that that sort of behavior is never going to be the sort of behavior that we can do. It's for saints. Look, this is what saints look like. <laughs> they're on icons and they're misty images, you know. They're pretty looking and everything is relatively perfect. They don't look like me. They don't look like you. Well, they might look like you. But <laughs> <laughs> well, now they might look like you as well. But my point is that we have made a wall of protection around our possibilities because we know what saints are like. We know what uh, those who are anointed by the Holy Spirit are like. We know what great men and women are like. And they're not like us. They're not like us. it's just a matter of a few different decisions. Sometimes it's uh, not standing up. Sometimes it's not fighting like with like, you know. Sometimes it's being in prison for many years and instead of swearing revenge and doing all the things that we're expected to do and all the things which every action and adventure movie will tell you to do because they dress you up to go out there swearing revenge. Somebody so much as kicks your wife in the shit and you go out and kill them, you know? But by swearing to do something different, by not returning like by life, that's really all it took. It took a lot of doing that, but that's really all it took. Um, we, uh, as a church, here at MCC, have a unique responsibility to do this. Uh, I preach, oh, I do dozens of sermons on this subject, and I'll preach them until my dying day. Because I happen to believe that Metropolitan Community Church has a special prophetic cause here. That we have a special prophetic call upon our lives. That we know better, therefore we must do better. We've been having these conversations about human equality and the dignity of human peoples since the late 1960s. And some of our brothers and sisters think they're doing well just by coming into the conversation a couple of years ago and saying, well, as long as you behave exactly like the Brady Bunch, like a heterosexual family, we might let you into church. Aren't we wonderful? No, you're not. No, it's not good enough. It's not good enough for us often, too. Even us, we have our comfort zones, our people who we start to feel, oh, 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 oh that's a little, a little too far, and do they really have to do that? Oh, that's just unnecessary. That's just upsetting people and shocking people. You know, they don't need all that. You know, what those tattoos for, you know? Just drawing attention to themselves. I enjoy people who draw attention to themselves. I enjoy people who are peculiar. I enjoy people who are odd and indecent. Amen. We are called to be odd and indecent. Metropolitan Community Churches have produced a unique theology, a queer theology, and often it is an indecent theology. It shocks people and it upsets people. It has the Last Supper like the Last Supper that advertised the Folsom Festival 
a few years ago with a collection of leather guys and drag queens and you name it uh, on, the, uh, on the table of the Last Supper. And the most shocking thing of all was that Jesus was African American. <laughs> <laughs> You know, generation, generation, generationally, we seem to jump back, you know? We think we're going forward, but we jump back. And we find that we are prissier than we've been for a long, long time. Preach. More prudish than we've been for a long, long time. More racist than we've been for a long, yes. long time. We yes. just dress it up in different words. We don't, we don't touch the issue of class and economics, and frequently, we disguise our racism in those terms. We disguise our sexism, because precious little has happened there. We still think it's going to be shocking and marvelous and extraordinary to elect the first woman president. Now, India did that in the early 70s, for goodness sakes. What's happened in the interim? Nothing? Why is this shocking? Okay, so I ranted on for a while. <laughs> it's Easter. We are in receipt of the glory of the risen Lord. Yes. Yes. That's got to mean something. That can't be something we do every year and we sit in church and we feel good. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be something that happens in our hearts. For our church to change, we have to bring people in, which usually means accepting them as they are. Yes. You meet people at a point of need, whatever that need may be, you accept them as they are, and then you build them up. Now, build them up is not restricted to telling them, oh, they're just fine and dandy as they are. It is also teaching and having a powerful teaching ministry. I don't know how many of you attended the Mark Bible study uh, that Deacon Jim uh, did uh, prior to Lent, but it was transformational to me. To me, I've been to seminary, I've been reading this stuff all my life, it was transformational. Those resources and that quality of resource is available here in this church, and it starts again on the 30th. Teaching is going to be... Uh, encouraged in a wide range of, of, of different means, you know. Uh, I have a reading list which I plow through uh, every month. I'm going to make that available. I'm also going to make available uh, the books which kind of approach that reading list. So if there's something that's particularly awkward and difficult uh, and boring, um, I will give you something which will approach the same subject, but from a slightly more accessible route. So there's teaching, and there's also uh, socializing, being friends with one another, loving one another, yeah. looking in on your neighbors, sitting with those who are sick and those who are dying. We do this well and we will do it better. We do this very well. We have a lot of people who have a lot of love for one another. Yeah, uh, that's important. That's a way of building people up building up people's confidence, building up people's love for one another, and that understanding that no matter how different they are, you can still see the face of Christ in them. Maybe without the beard, in some cases. <laughs> and then, sending them out. Well, sending them out. If you have a congregation whereby people are well resourced, where people are resourced with their teaching, where they are resourced with their spirit, that the preaching and the service and the sacraments have built them up and taught them what Christianity may be, what extraordinary resource this faith may be. As received by Metropolitan Community Church, but also as received by a wide range of different churches, as received by the church over the last 2,000 years then people are ready to go out of this place, not just as churchgoers, but as missionaries, and in the right way. Missionaries because of your testimony. Missionaries because of your resources. Missionaries because you are the sort of person that attracts others to you. 
because you have something which is attractive, because you have that spirit resting upon you. Now, there are other ways to build numbers in a church, much quicker ways, but they do exactly that. They build numbers in a church, bums on seats. This is such an important business that it must be done properly. And it must be done in the long term. And it must be done with the congregation buying into it. And it must be done by the grace of God. So, this Easter is the beginning of a whole new year, effectively. I see it as a new liturgical year. Uh, and it has amazing opportunities. This is Grounds, this is starting from scratch again. Um, and you can start in small ways, a daily devotion, a daily prayer. Habit forming is the most wonderful thing. If you do something every day, no matter how small, soon it becomes part of who you are. Yes. That sounds like, you know, we expect everything to be a road to Damascus conversion uh, nowadays. Well, it's not like that sometimes. Sometimes it's it's hard work. When I first started saying the breviary, the office, I absolutely despised it. I lost my place every day, and my vicar would be just across the way from me, and he'd be tutting, and then I'd lose my ribbons, would be all over the place, and I'd have to say, uh, what, what, uh, what page, page is it, Father? <laughs> 42, Father. Uh, and eventually I got there. So I want to close now, um, but I want to uh, close with the possibility that as Mary, um, as we go through our life yearning and uh, pining for something which we believe we've lost, uh, that we are continually being asked what we've lost by Jesus himself. That God doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, Jesus doesn't go anywhere and is there for us intimately and closely.